Hey everyone, welcome back. This is the fifth video in our series about rhythm. If you haven't watched the first four, then I highly suggest you go back and watch those because we're gonna be building on everything that we've talked about so far. In the previous episodes, we talked about what rhythm is, how to subdivide, what swing is, and some of the different types of swing. So we've established a good foundation now. The next step is to start learning some actual patterns. What patterns? Hey man, that's so formulaic. I wanna just jam, you know, express myself freely. I don't wanna be imprisoned in a bunch of patterns. Yes, I know stock photo jazz man. I too was once like you. And that's exactly why I wanted to make this video. I studied jazz for years and jazz is really hard and it's extremely focused on improvisation, which is also really hard. So when I went to play rhythm guitar in a funk context or even just in a wedding band, I automatically assumed that I had all the skills I needed to do it. I'd subconsciously felt like, well, if I can improvise this ultra complex music on the spot, then I'm already overqualified to play funk or blues or soul or anything that's simpler than jazz. But the more sort of funk gigs I played, especially with really good musicians, the more I started to feel like I just didn't have any of the actual skills required to play it at all. I would play a whole night and I would either find that I was playing the same thing on every song or even worse, that I was just trying a bunch of different things and none of them were working. So it was actually a giant revelation for me to appreciate that in this other kind of music, it's actually really important to learn how to play patterns. Funk is all about patterns, and honestly, any music that isn't the most avant-garde, free-form kind of music is gonna be using patterns a lot, but especially when you're talking about groove-oriented music meaning music that has a solid groove, a pocket, repeating patterns that form a feel upon which the song is based. But I'm not saying we're gonna be stuck playing only patterns. That's not the idea here at all. We still need to absolutely use our artistry and our taste to make the music our own. Once you have a solid grasp of pattern-oriented music, you can do everything from adding variations to outright improvisation. But you can't do that right away. You have to first pick a pattern, repeat yourself, find the pocket, and then you're ready to start adding variations. If you don't establish a rhythmic pattern to begin with, then you don't really have anything upon which to elaborate. And even worse, you probably are gonna have a really hard time finding any way to lock in with your fellow musicians. So thinking about it this way, a pattern isn't a prison, it's a canvas upon which to improvise. Okay, so let's learn a pattern. We're gonna start with a rhythm that is very common in funk music, and it's a version of the clave pattern. The clave is a very specific rhythm found in Afro-Cuban music, and there are similar ideas in all kinds of Latin American and African diaspora musics around the world. This isn't gonna be a video about that because honestly I don't know that much about it, and there are much smarter people on the internet that we can learn from. But just to give you a general idea, the clave can be thought of as a sort of skeleton rhythm around which all the rhythms of a song are built. Sometimes an instrument will literally play the clave. This is often played by an instrument of the same name, but sometimes it's just sort of implied by the rhythms that everyone is playing. For our purposes, we're gonna be writing it out in halftime to put it in our funky 16th note world. And there is actually one difference between this rhythm and the traditional Afro-Cuban clave. Extra bonus points if you can tell me what that difference is. Okay, so let's learn this rhythm. We're gonna play the same A minor chord that we were playing on the last time with the Charleston. Just the top three notes, C, E, A, and as usual, I am using my left hand fingers to sort of mute the other strings so I can just strum freely. So let's fill in every 16th note in this written part so that we have all of our ghost notes in between. Now let's count it out and strum along. One E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one E and a two E and a three E and a four E and a one A and E four. One A and E four. Now let's circle our down and up arrows. 
which gives us the pattern down, up, down, up, down. Down, up, down, up, down. Down, up, down, up, down. At this point, I'd like to also talk about how to learn this rhythm by ear rather than by reading it. Let's say that you heard this rhythm on a record and you wanted to figure it out. First of all, I'd sing it while tapping or clapping to the beat. But to really understand this rhythm, I like to count on my fingers. In part two of this series, I talked about this briefly. Let me show you exactly what I mean. I do this in two ways. The first way is one finger per beat. One, two, three. This is helpful for One, looking at the two, rhythm as a whole three, and just four. trying to see where some of the notes hit right on downbeats. So using this method, I can tell that the first rhythm falls right on beat 1 and the last rhythm falls right on beat 4. In between, I'm not so sure, I just know there aren't any downbeats. The second way I count is by making each finger a 16th note. This is what I use for especially tricky rhythms that I need to look at with a microscope. So using this method, I can figure out that the count is one, a, uh, n, e, four. One, a, uh, n, e, four. And then either memorize that or write it out. And as I've said before, you don't have to write this out the traditional way, really any way that makes sense to you. Although it might be worth learning the traditional way because in the long run it is a lot faster. Okay, so now we know the rhythm, so let's practice bringing it up to speed. There's probably no better example of this rhythm than in the music of James Brown. In fact, there are so many examples that we're not even going to take the time to go through them all in detail. I put a link in the description for a playlist that you can follow and practice along with. Here's the extremely abbreviated practice guide. cool thing about this rhythm is something that you might have already noticed, which is that it alternates between down and up strums the whole time. That makes it a little bit easier to remember, but why is that happening? It's because we're playing in groups of threes, meaning we play one note, then we rest for two notes, and then we repeat that pattern. If we played in groups of twos, we would end up using only down strums or only up strums. Groups of threes means that we naturally alternate. This sort of internal pattern within a pattern is part of what gives this rhythm such an infectious and satisfying feeling. It's also a great example of a really neat musical technique called the hemiola. A hemiola is a musical figure that plays with the natural syncopation that happens when you divide music into groups of twos and threes. Let's imagine a situation where we have 12 beats. We can divide the 12 beats by one and get this. Very exciting. Or we can divide it by two and get this. Dividing by three gives you this. Four gives you this. Six gives you this. And 12 gives you this. We don't need to do 12, you, you get it. So a hemiola can happen if we stack two of these on top of each other. For example, three and four.
There's a mnemonic device for this particular rhythm, but it's lewd, and so far, this channel has been wholesome, so I'm going to keep it that way. But I can't stop you from putting it in the comments if you really feel like you have to. Okay, so three over four sounds cool, so what? Well, look what happens if we add another group of four to the end of this. Now we have that exact same funk clave pattern from before. Our guitar pattern superimposed on top of just the regular quarter note beat of the song gives you a hemiola effect. It's almost like you're playing in two different meters at the same time, but then locking back in right on beat four. It's also interesting and cool to me that this pattern is almost like a natural extension of the Charleston rhythm that we did before. The Charleston is basically just the first two notes of this pattern. Now we can take that same group of three pattern and just continue it over the rest of the measure. So I realized that I have neglected to give any homework out since the very first video, and that's just irresponsible. So your homework assignment for this time is to practice this funk clave pattern at different tempos, just like we did earlier in the video, but of course, starting slow and only moving faster once you're comfortable and you're feeling the pocket. And of course, you should play along with a metronome or even better, a drum beat. You can also play along with that playlist that I linked to in the bottom with all the James Brown songs. You can try to use different kinds of swing or playing it straight. Just remember to keep scratching along with all of those ghost notes in between. Keep all your chords short and try to make everything as even as possible. Okay, in the next video, we're gonna keep moving forward and introduce a concept that can turn one pattern into many. Thank you for watching. This is a very new channel, so please subscribe. I was thinking that maybe once I get to a thousand subscribers, I could do something fun, like maybe do a video analyzing the outro music, or it could be something else. If you have any suggestions, just go ahead and suggest them in the comments. Also, I just started a new series called Pedal Exploration, where we explore the magical world of guitar pedals, so look out for those if you're into that stuff. And that's it. Thank you for watching, and I'll see you next time.